tackling environmental and resource challenges. This webinar is part of a series supporting teaching with Integrate principles using piloted, peer-reviewed, Integrate developed and curated materials as tools. And on the screen and in the chat box, there's a link to the webinar event page where you can find the presentation slides, resources related to the presentation, and after the presentation, there will be a recording of the webinar. If you happen to lose video during the presentation, you can go to that page, download the slides, and follow along. If you have questions along the way, you can type them into the chat box. So with that, I'm happy to introduce today's speakers, Diane Dozer from the University of Texas at El Paso and Gigi Richard from Colorado Mesa University, who will be presenting Sustainable Solutions to Societal Issues, Teaching Earth Literacy Across the Undergraduate Curriculum. You guys able to advance the slides? Oh, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm not able to. OK. I lost internet connection, so let me fire that back up. <laughs> I'm able to. OK, good. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, so for those of you just joining the conference, it gives you an idea who you are talking to. I am Diane Dozer, and uh, Gigi will be kind of uh, interleaving slides with me. Uh, we want to welcome you to this conference. Um, looking at people's backgrounds, it looks like about half of you do have some kind of experience with Integrate Materials, and then about half of you do not. So hopefully, um, we can cover some things that um, may be new to those of you that are already using Integrate Materials. Um, just to get an idea of the background of the participants, we were wondering if you could uh, show by, you can see there's a little icon with a, with a fellow raising their hand. How many of you are, are representing um, institutions that would be either like two-year colleges or high schools? Could you, could you raise your hand? OK. Uh, for some reason, Monica, I am not getting any any response from my. Um, I think there's one one person right here. One hand. person. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm kind of going blind. <laughs> All right. So there's one person um, that from a two-year institution. I just want to emphasize that um, even though Gigi and I are from four-year institutions, a lot of these activities are things that have been tried by two-year institutions. Um, work closely with El Paso Community College faculty, and many of these uh, activities are used in, in uh, their classes as well. Um, Monica, can I have the next slide, please? So we're going to try to introduce some of the Integrate materials and hopefully point out for those of you that are somewhat familiar with the materials, maybe some new uh, activities and ideas that you could try. Uh, we especially want to focus on materials that are related to sustainability. And then towards the end of this um, webinar, we'd like to mention a couple um, opportunities with the Traveling Workshop Program so that if you are interested in learning more um, or working hands-on, there'll be um, some opportunities for you to do that. Um, as well as to perhaps bring the workshop to your institution um, to have everybody that's involved in teaching at your institution in sustainability type issues um, uh, be able to try some of this material. Uh, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to type into the chat box. And we will try to answer the questions as we go along. And we want to have a break sort of in between talking about the integrate materials and the traveling workshops to be sure that um, if there are fresh questions in your mind, that, that you can ask them at that point in time. Can I have the next question? Um, so I think we've already actually established this because you did um, answer this question. And just to make sure, can we see again uh, how many of you have used this uh, material on a course? So if you want to go ahead and 
Can you ask me that question? Diane, your audio just got really fuzzy. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Does that better? Yes. All right. So it looks like at least um, of the people that have responded, it looks like some of you have at least used it once or twice, but then maybe about half of you have never used the materials. So that gives us a good idea of, of what to emphasize, um, especially when Gigi talks about some of the um, some of the way that the integrate materials are structured. Monica, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so just to to give you some background, um, we thought we would introduce things with just an example of one of the activities that you could use um, in your classroom. And this is a gallery box activity, which is very popular in all sizes of classrooms. So at UT El Paso, we've used it in very large classes, say over 120 students in the class, an uh, introduction environmental science class. And then you can see on the lower right that there's a smaller class, probably of about 30 students, that are, are using the gallery walk technique. Um, and the focus in this particular gallery walk is to look at how uh, some ancient civilizations have adapted or didn't adapt to climate change. And then it leads into a discussion of how can we adapt to climate change? How are we going to um, work to kind of sustain the kinds of, of, of things that we have now, but in the, in the prospect of having, say, it getting much warmer, especially here in El Paso. And so the students read this uh, either as homework or in class, and then once they complete the reading, they might be given a quiz. That's another way to assess whether they understood the material. And then we lead them on into a a uh, series of questions that are posted around the classroom. And so you can see up at the upper right that we have a question and we go from the students in groups and they go through. That, Diane, question. we're really having a hard time hearing okay. you. Okay. All right. It's not clear at all. Yeah. All right. So, um, so what we're doing is we have questions that are posted around the classroom and they relate to the reading that the students have and we um, have them answer questions in groups. And what you can see at the upper right is that we are um, looking at the answers from different groups. And students really enjoy this activity. In a larger group, you can see on the lower left that the students are just answering the questions going around to different tables because there may be 10, 10 groups working on separate questions at a time or more. And then for smaller groups, you can see they're posted. And just surveying the students at the end of the semester, about 20% of them remember this activity and rank that as one of their favorites. So next uh, slide. I think this is where I jump in. Right. Um, thanks, Diane. So this is, I'm Gigi Richard at Colorado Mesa University. and. Um, first, wanted to go through a little bit of background about Integrate, and it sounds like this will probably be helpful for those of you who have not uh, used any Integrate materials yet. So the Integrate program is funded by a five-year NSF STEP Center grant, so it's the Earth Sciences um, Center, and the goal is to support teaching of geoscience in the context of societal issues um, across the undergraduate curriculum. One of the goals is to develop curricula that will increase our literacy of undergraduate students. And that's really where we're focused um, with these, this work is this uh, materials, I'm going to turn on my little marker, there we go, um, the materials development piece of the integrate charge. Um, and the course material that's developed through the integrate program has some common themes. It's, it's all interdisciplinary. Um, and it's multi-institutional, meaning that the course material teams, the material development teams, are faculty that come from a variety of different types of institutions. And the course materials are um, piloted at different types of institutions. The course materials also span uh, levels from introductory level course materials to upper level course materials. All of the materials have been peer reviewed. 
um, like I said, they've been piloted, and they've been piloted at different types of institutions, and in, um, public and private, and smaller and larger, and different size classes. And then all of the course materials have undergone some rigorous assessment. So uh, one of the things that's great about Integrate course materials is you know that they are robust and that they've been vetted um, and they're, they're high quality. Uh, the Integrate program also has a piece uh, where that, that involves implementation of the course materials. And then also there's some professional development. And that's um, Diane will talk about that a little bit more with the traveling workshop program at the end. Um, the Integrate website, if you're interested, is right down here. Um, it gives you a little more information on this index site about the, the actual program. So the course materials um, all use authentic data. Um, and that's one of the, I find, I think, is one of the real advantages of these materials, because I really like to incorporate data into my classes. Um, they all have to foster system thinking. Uh, which is a very important um, uh, facility that students need to have in earth sciences. Um, they all focus on improving geoscientific thinking skills to be able to think about time and spatial skills. Um, they also connect geoscience to grand challenges facing society, such as issues related to water resources, mineral resources, human population growth, global climate change, um, sustainability. Um, and they're, like I said before, they're all interdisciplinary, so they develop students' ability to address interdisciplinary problems. And so sustainability, you can imagine um, sort of cross cuts across all of these um, different areas of focus of the integrate materials. And so uh, you'll find that sustainability is in many of the integrate course materials, even if it's not specifically in the title. Um, Integrate course materials are organized in sort of a hierarchy. Some of the materials are full courses. A course is made up of modules. You will also find integrate course materials that are just modules. So a module is a, a piece of a, of a, a semester. Um, so you could grab a module off the integrate page and implement it for you know, anywhere from one to three or four weeks of your course. Um, and then individual modules are made up of units. And a unit is often one class period, um, but some of them might span two because you may have to you know, have some prep and then some discussion and then activity. Um, many of them are very hands-on. Um, they work really well with the flipped classroom approach. Um, so some caveats. Uh, if you're going to use integrate course materials, I would recommend taking some time to actually go through the module and figure out how it's actually going to fit into your course. And there are a lot of resources on the pages that we'll share with you that will help you figure out how to fit it into your course. Um, and what I found is while these are very robust, fabulous materials, it's not that easy to just pull it off the shelf and stick it into your class. <laughs> then you sometimes have to take a little time to kind of dig into um, what you need in your class. You know, are there extra materials you're going to need? Um, and then I often take the handouts and sort of adapt them to my particular class so that they fit in with my class. Um, many of these different either modules or units or even the activities that are within an individual unit can be extracted and fit into your course. Um, and so the materials really are modular, modular, and I've found that to be really helpful. I've been able to pull activities and pieces out of different modules and classes to use, use in my classes. Um, and also the length of the, both the units and the modules vary. And so that's something you have to kind of pay attention to when you're exploring the materials um, to see how they'll fit and how long they take. Uh, there's a great website that goes through actually using integrate modules and courses in your website. And I think Monica will put the link um, in the chat box there. Um, that's really helpful. Um, all of the integrate course material pages are set up the same way. Um, there's an instructor set of pages. And there, this includes all of the materials that you need to teach your course. Um, it also includes link to all, links to all of the documents. If there are PowerPoints, or Word docs, or Excel spreadsheets, or PDFs, or videos, um, all of those are linked there and available for download. 
Um, some of those documents, because they include solutions to the activities, some of those documents might actually require that you log in and prove that you're faculty. But once you go through that process, it's really quick to, um, to log in every time you need the materials. And so it's really not, it's not a big deal. But it just keeps the students from snagging all of those solutions. Um, one of the things that's really helpful you'll find in the instructor materials are tips for teaching. And so those are ideas for how you might adapt it for different types of classes, different sizes of classes, um, classrooms where you have access to computers versus classes where you don't have access to computers. So all of those things that are going to affect how you're going to adapt the materials to your class um, are in there. Each of the course material pages also includes a set of pages that are just for students. So you can give links to these pages to your students, and it's just the student materials with whatever instructions that they need. So that can be really helpful. I tend to adapt the materials to my class, and so haven't actually been giving them those links, but the links are available, um, and you could certainly use those. Um, in addition, all of the course materials include assessments, and so there is an assessment section of each course material site that includes all of the assessments for the whole module in one place. Um, also, the assessments are all tied to the learning objective, so it can be, you can see very clearly how um, the module fits together. Um, there are also formative assessments and summative assessments for all of the modules. And finally, one of the things that I also found really helpful are instructor stories, which when the materials are piloted at the different universities, the instructor that does the pilot writes the story of how they adapted that course material to their situation. And that could be you know, different size of classes, different levels. Is it a majors or a non-majors class? What type of institution? Um, and you know what? Where were the challenges? Where were the you know the things that worked really well? Um, and 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 these instructor stories can be really helpful when you're figuring out how to fit the course materials into your class. Um, so that's kind of the basic structure of all of the integrate course materials. Whether you're looking at a module or a course that's made of modules, um, they all have this this similar structure with all of these materials. Um, we're going to dive into talking about some of these integrate course materials. And I've just highlighted a few of the modules and courses that are sustainability related here. Um, if you go to the, the integrate main page, what I usually get there, just Google CERC integrate, and it's the first hit. And you click on the button that's on the left that says explore the material. It'll take you to a page, that's this button here. It'll take you to a page that has all of the published modules and courses now. And I've just um, highlighted a few of them here that are specifically sustainability related. And there are a few that are, are water, water and food, um, one about oceans, mineral resources, carbon, global climate change, um, and soils. Um, and like I said, most integrate materials have sustainability embedded in them. Um, I just noticed there was a question in the chat asking about the kinds of modifications that I've made to the materials and why. Um, and the kinds of modifications might be to leave out something because maybe I've already covered it in a different part of the class. Like if there's, you know, the module might include like introductory background material, and I might have already done that in a different part of the class, and so might leave that out. Um, I might decide that I want to do the assessment a little differently, and so might take, you know, if there's like a worksheet or handout, might change it, eliminate some questions, um, shorten it to make it fit in a 50-minute class period. Um, each of the uh, units and modules and courses are designed for a certain length of class time. Um, and some are 75 minutes, some are 60 minutes, some are 50 minutes, and so you, sometimes you have to adapt. Uh, to make it fit in your class period. Um, I'm trying to think of what other changes I've made. Um, oh, well, the other piece is maybe putting it online. You know, if there's p if parts of a module that I might want students to do a little quiz or something that they'll do online before they come to class, 
that kind of thing. So I could put it in my in D2L, our learning management system. Um, so those are the kinds of changes that I've made. And it's just to make it fit into my semester and my, my class. Um, OK, so when you actually go to a module um, or a course, this will be the, the home integrate page that you'll get to. So I just did a screenshot of the water sustainability in cities module. And you'll see that on all of the pages, they all look the same. And they tell you right here what level of course that um, the module is developed for. It's nine units, and it's intended to take three to five weeks. Uh, and this is this varies from module to module. Um, also, it you know it says this this summary explains um, the summary explains what's in the module. Um, it points out the lessons are data driven exercises. It uses a flipped classroom approach. Um, and what a little bit about the content of the module, and it's nine integrated lessons, um, approximately three weeks. Um, this module, oh, sorry, I forgot about the download button, which I find to be really useful. So each of these, if you're on the main page for the module of, or course, you can download a PDF of the entire module, uh, which I find to be really helpful and just getting an idea of what really goes on in the module and what are the different activities. And I find it a lot easier to just flip through a PDF than to have to page through all of the web pages. Um, so I think that that download button is really helpful when you're trying to figure out how a module works and what pieces of it that you want to use. Um, so this module in particular is, like I said, focused on Water Sustainability in Cities, and it was designed by a team of engineers. Um, and I, I was on this team for this development. And the idea was to integrate engineering into earth science courses or more earth science into engineering courses. And so one of the pieces of engineering that's incorporated into this module is the idea of a design project. And so there's um, one activity, which we'll get into more details in a little bit, where students do a urban landscape design. And then that piece integrates into a whole subdivision design at the end, where they're thinking about um, the whole urban hydrologic cycle. So they're introduced to the hydrologic cycle and then how, urban, how it changes in urban areas. And this module uses real data and also real tools, um, like the EPA stormwater calculator. Um, so they actually are using real tools. They use a lot of spreadsheets um, and data. They design uh, uh, they changes in indoor fixtures to conserve water indoors, and then they deal with outdoor water use. Um, so this is just one example of a sustainability-focused module. And we'll dive into one of the activities in this module um, in a little bit. Um, all right, so the next module we were going to highlight is uh, one on water agriculture and sustainability. And this one is designed for more of an intro to intermediate level um, class. And notice this one is five units that takes three to five weeks. So again, the length of a unit can vary. Um, and how long you spend on it will depend on how long your, um, your class periods are and how you um, organize the use of the module. So the, this one is designed to take 11 one-hour class sections, um, sessions. And it focuses on water footprints and then also the impact of irrigating uh, using either groundwater or surface water. So there's a, um, there are units on specifically on groundwater and then some specifically on surface water. And then it gets into the impacts of agriculture on water quality and has a focus on eutrophication and dead zones, looking at freshwater pollution. Um, so that's another example of another sustainability-focused uh, module. Um, another sustainability-focused module, it's not a water one, is on Earth mineral resources. And I've used uh, some activities out of this one. Again, you know, things are really modular, so I've pulled out just activities out of this one that I've used in my environmental geology course. Um, so this is more intro level, six units over two to three weeks. And these are designed for 50-minute class sessions. Um, 
And one of the things I like about this module is it ties human population growth, the demographic transition, and population growth in lesser developed and more developed countries, uh, and relates that to consumption um, and mineral use, and incorporates in sustainability while also including the underlying geologic concepts that are related to mineral use. And you also get into economics, too, of mineral use. So um, this is another, uh, well, they're all great. <laughs> so um, all right, so I think let's see if anybody has any questions about the structure of the integrate materials before we dig into um, more details about some uh, activities that are in integrate modules. So Monica, will people actually ask questions on audio or just chat? On the chat box. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat, please. OK. So one of the questions is, have you adapted modules from higher level to lower level courses? And um, I guess, uh, yes, to some extent. And actually, this activity that I'm going to go over next is from that Water Sustainability in Cities, which was really designed for upper level courses. And I piloted it in a 200 level course for majors. So um, it. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't shift it to an intro level, but I did shift it to kind of a more, a little lower level course. At the other schools, it was piloted as in upper division, either atmospheric science or engineering courses. And I did it in a 200 level majors course. Um, and it worked really well. And again, you know, you just have to maybe add a little intro materials or, um, uh, or eliminate activities that might be a little too, you know, beyond what the, the level of the course is, is at. So that's a great question. Um, all right, I'm going to, I'll keep moving. But if you have more questions, please just type them in and, and we'll address them. Um, so this activity is unit four from the Water Sustainability in Cities module. And it's focused on urban landscapes and water use. And it's a group design activity. Um, and it uses real data for reference evapotranspiration. And the students have to compute irrigation water use for outdoor landscaping. And the first question they have to address is, how much water does a turf backyard use? So they're given a schematic of a house with a backyard. And they're given evapotranspiration data for the city of Fort Collins for, I think, the month of July from 2013. So it's real data. And this is another example, actually, of how you can adapt this to your course. In the module, uh, the unit and the instructions, the instructor materials, it explains, here are some places you could go get ET data from your location if you want to actually use real data from where you're, uh, where you're located. And then there's also an option to do this for a um, university building on the University of Utah campus in Salt Lake City. So if you didn't want to do a home in Fort Collins, Colorado, you could do a university building in U University of Utah, or you could find ET data from your location and adapt it um, there. And there's also the Excel spreadsheets are given to you, so you could do it in a classroom with computers, or there are handouts that you could do in a classroom where you don't have computers. So I did it. We didn't have computers in our classroom, so the students all did this by hand. Um, so first, they figure out how much water does the turf backyard use um, for the total month of July. And then they're given the schematic, and they have to design a water-efficient landscape. And they're, you know, you're, they have a lot of criteria. They're given you know, suggestions about aesthetics and how people like green and you know, so that they don't just pave over the whole thing. Um, and, and they're given options of flowering plants versus grass and hardscape. Um, and then they calculate how much water does their water efficient landscape use. And they, they're given a goal that they need to get to a certain reduction from the turf to their efficient landscape. And then they give a little presentation. Um, and I, I did this 
the week before Thanksgiving in my class, and the students started it on Wednesday, and then they had to finish it on Friday before Thanksgiving and give their presentations. And I had perfect attendance in my class that day, which my colleagues were all like, oh, I had half my students show up. You know, it's the Friday before Thanksgiving break. And so the students were really engaged in it, really excited. Some of them did much fancier, you know, colored drawings and, you know, had it all looking really nice for their presentations. Um, but so I, I found in, in, in piloting this module that the engagement with this flipped classroom style um, was, was great. There, it was a lot of work with all of the prep um, for me and for the students. Like they, they had assignments every single day that they had to, you know, watch a video, answer questions. Um, and so there was a lot of handing things out, picking things up, and a lot of grading. But wow, they were really engaged. Um, so the next activity um, that I'll, I'll share, and then I'll turn it over to Diane, is a um, assessment that's in module one of a course. So Water Science and Society is an entire course, and it's built so that you can offer it online or you could adapt it for an in-class situation. Um, I teach a course called Water, People, and Environment that's quite similar to this class, and so I've adapted quite a few of the activities from this, this class into my in-person class. This first water use project is the summative assessment for the first module. And the students record their personal direct water use for one week. And you're, you give them a little log, and they journal um, the time, the activity, the water use that they estimate. And I gave them a, a bunch of resources for estimating how much, you know, if they flush a the toilet, they wash their hands, that sort of thing. Um, and it, the students were, at first, really kind of overwhelmed for a little bit. And then they kind of got into it when they realized they could just maybe make tally marks, you know, to make it easier to record. And, um, and the other piece of the assignment is they also research indirect water usage that goes into producing one item that they use regularly. And there are a lot of resources provided in the module. And, you know, for example, how much water goes into making their pizza. Um, and then they're asked to do a little bit more research into that. And I had students get in. Like, one of them really got into toilet paper. Um, it was great. She gave a little talk to the class about how much water goes into our, all of our, and actually doing the processing of the paper. And, um, so they then compare their water usage to average per capita water usage, and they analyze their personal water usage habitat as well, habit, and then um, uh, also explain their they're the one product that they research. So um, I found this to be a great way to start the semester with them really thinking about how much water they actually use and how much water is embedded in all of the, the products that they use. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Diane now, who's going to talk about a similar water use project that she's done um, that's from the Environmental Justice and Freshwater Module. Yes, yeah, so some of the uh, information that um, that Gigi just presented, you'll find that there are similar type of activities, but in different modules. And again, this was taught for an introductory course. And for homework, they did personal usage, but not probably as intensely as what Gigi just presented. So they, they had just rough estimates. They didn't have to keep track for a week. They just reflected back over the last week and made some approximations, like how many showers they took a day and so forth. Um, they had to complete this as homework and turn it in. And then um, they came in and compared their results with other members of the groups that they'd been working with all semester. And so they could compare between each other to see how much water they were using. And then they, uh, to adapt this, to make it more relevant to the local um, you know, interests of the students, I gave them the average water usage for El Paso and for Juarez, which is just across the border from us. And I think that really put into perspective, uh, a lot of them were using a lot more water just um, than the El Paso average, let alone the Juarez average. So I really think that made an impact on them in thinking about, you know, water is, is a precious resource in our desert, and look how much I'm using. Then we went on, and we, similar to what Gigi did, but just I, I actually gave them the information, was to say, OK, let's consider we have uh, 650,000 people in El Paso eating breakfast. 
Um, they're going to have cereal with milk and so forth and orange juice. And how much water are we going to be using then to produce breakfast for El Paso? Again, somewhat of a stunning figure when they went through these um, calculations. And uh, it was also a very popular activity. I think the students really felt that um, the, something they remembered till the end of the semester, and I think made a difference, at least for some of them, in how they were going to use water in the future. Um, so those are examples of, of some of the activities we've done, and we just wanted to know if there were any questions about these activities that we could answer. So if you have a question, you could, you could type in the chat box. Good. Looks like we have a couple. <laughs> yes, for large for the large classes, I do have one teaching assistant that helps with managing. Um, and But what I find is if I structure the class from the beginning and divide them up into groups the first week, um, they get used to the idea that they're going to work in the same groups. And I also um, put all materials into uh, folders so that they come at the beginning of class, they pick up their folders, um, they know that they're going to work on activity in that folder. They will hand the activity back in in that folder. All exams, quizzes, everything goes into their folders. And it's a really good system for um, making it easy for the students to um, hand things in and start working on their assignments. And once they get the hang of it, mostly the teaching assistant and I are kind of wandering around making sure they don't have questions um, or just kind of quizzing them a little, showing that we are interested and involved. My classes are all really small, and I don't have TAs, so. Right, uh, right. Yeah, so, so a lot of cases, if you have a larger class, um, you can do this. I also teach engineers, and I teach up to um, uh, 80 engineers at a time. It's an upper division class, and um, I teach it all by myself, and I can still use that particular um, method of, of folders and, and the group activities. OK. Um, so again, if you have other questions, uh, just be sure to, to type them in here. I wanted to go on and talk a little bit about professional development. So um, if you are interested, but you're not ready to make the plunge to go online and, and try to adapt things yourself, there's a couple different ways that you might be able to get some more help. One is that Gigi and I are going to be offering a workshop at the AGU meeting on sustainable solutions and how we use the integral, uh, integrate materials in um, these uh, particular classes. And so we'll walk through a couple activities so you can work them out and see how they operate. And we will also walk, uh, walk you through trying to develop at least one activity that you could use in your class. So if you are planning on attending the AGU meeting, uh, we are going to give the workshop on Tuesday afternoon and would be happy to help you develop um, some activities that you could use in your course you know, as early as the spring semester. Um, there is also a traveling workshop program which allows a group of uh, faculty or, or some of them also work for other organizations to come and visit your institution. Um, and these workshops can focus specifically on developing or revising curriculum, uh, also working on sustainability programs for your institutions, 
And if, say, you're having an external review going to come up in a year or so, we can also help with developing and strengthening your program so you look, um, you look good for your review. There are a variety of themes that you can uh, choose. Normally, we try to come for a day and a half to two-day workshop. And during the second day, we have uh, sort of elective themes. You can see some of these here, um, especially notice that there is, there is one that relates directly to cross-campus environmental and sustainability programs. We also have things about how do you support all the students that might be in your classes. Um, and another issue that really works well with sustainability effective and societ societally relevant courses. So these are all activity, these are all sort of uh, workshop electives that you could choose um, if you want to make an application. Um, we go to single institutions. Um, these are especially helpful if you want uh, say you have an upcoming external review, we could come in a, um, uh, a year or so before that and help you. Um, also, uh, we've had cases where people are, are deciding to create a completely new degree program, need to bring in a number of different departments that are all going to collaborate in this. Uh, we can help set that up. Uh, again, especially with sort of sustainability type of degree programs, this might be an ideal thing to consider. Uh, also, for two-year colleges or these cross-disciplinary things, we can we have worked with multi-institutions. Uh, I was working in California uh, last month with a group of about ten different two-year colleges, and we are working on. Uh, issues related to curriculum development and assessment. So if you are interested in this program, um, the application deadline that's coming up right away is October 15th. And there's also one in, in March. So mostly the October deadline is if you'd like to have something in the spring, we'd really urge you to um, try to apply. And then if you uh, are thinking more in terms of next fall, then the March deadline might be uh, better for you. Uh, there's the application uh, link. And also, I think Monica is uh, going to type that in for you. And we try to let you know pretty quickly uh, about your status of your application. And normally, like I said, if you want to apply in October, we'd probably be considering then a visit in, in the spring semester. And try, if you do apply, to schedule these at a time where you can get as many faculty as possible to, uh, to be involved in this. Because really, it helps if everybody is involved and engaged in these activities. So that sort of concludes what Gigi and I wanted to say, both about um, the individual modules and courses and some other opportunities for digging a little deeper and getting more development about sustainability issues. Uh, we want to thank you. And, uh, and, and questions here. I see another question. How much time did it take to adapt the modules? Um, it doesn't take a lot of time, um, I don't think. Uh, Maybe a week or two. Gigi, you might be able to. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's, I would say, highly variable. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, either there's some pieces, like activities, that I've been able to pull out and implement more quickly than others. I think it just depends on how much the module varies from your style and how much you have to adapt it, you know, like how much you're going to have to change to fit it into your class. Because there are some things where I'm like, oh, I really like this idea, but the way it's presented doesn't fit perfectly. So I really end up doing a lot of the work to make it fit, whereas others I'm like, oh, this is perfect and it fits in really um, well. And it's just what it takes is maybe, you know, a few hours of me like really reading through the material and understanding 
what the different activities are and how they work. Um, and I, I guess the other thing that I've found is I it can take a while just to read through all of the, the different activities to figure out which ones um, you know fit and do what you what you want. But those summaries at the beginning are really helpful, um, and each unit and activity has a little summary box at the top too. So um, those those are really helpful to try to you know just kind of like. Uh, quickly go through and pick ones that you think might work. I would mention too that if if you can find more than one colleague that's that's willing to try things, you can develop things as a group. And actually, once you get something developed, I've had a lot of colleagues just come in and and take what I've developed for a particular class and just kind of take take it off the shelf and use it in their class quite successfully. Uh, so they're happy to just pretty much take what that they know it works for a 50-minute class. They, they happily take that, what I've put together, and they just use it in their class. So once, once you get some of this material um, into a form that fits your class, I, I think that other people will use it too. So that, that's kind of nice because then you know that different sections of the class, the students are getting similar type of experiences. With that, um, as you guys type additional questions, if you have any, I'm just going to go on to the final slide. So thank you so very much, Gigi and Diane, and thank you all for attending this webinar. Um, I just wanted to mention a few more small pieces. Um, so at the top of this slide, I've listed the next couple webinars we have scheduled. Um, there's one scheduled for Wednesday of next week um, on strengthening K-8 teacher preparation, um, and registration is open for that already. Then there's one in November. Registration is not yet open for that one, but we'll let you know when it is. Um, second, uh, as Diane had mentioned, we have the Traveling Workshops program. Third, there's the Earth Educators Rendezvous at the University of Kansas. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to continue to the discussion we had today um, on this discussion board. And then finally, um, we have a end of web webinar survey. So if you have feedback you'd like to provide, we'd really appreciate it. I'll paste that in the chat box as well. So thank you very much. We'll hang out for a couple minutes if you have more questions. And I guess I should mention, if anyone has more questions and they want to email me directly, I'm happy to email or call and talk about using Integrate Materials in your courses, um, you know, if you want to contact me directly. Monica, are our emails shared anywhere, or should I type it in? Um, we can probably type it in, or I can find your faculty page and put that in. OK. Well, I'll just I'll link in my. Yeah.